Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Molly Eddie Carroll, and you are watching Bring Your Own Hero. This is a three-day comics illustration masterclass with the one, the only, Klaus Schawinski. Klaus, it's great to see you. How are you doing today? That's me. I'm doing great. Weather is fantastic in Amsterdam, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a good day to talk about comic books. Indeed. So, and of course, hello to everybody currently watching us live all over the world. Hello, Jana, I see in the chat. Hello, Emma. Hello, George, Sundrina, uh, Rufus. This is great. Really, really active chat. And of course, if you would like to participate in the chat and maybe ask Klaus a couple of questions, you can head over to behance.net slash Adobe Live and you can join the fun there. So Klaus, for those who need a recap of your fabulous career, could you tell the audience who you are and what you've worked on? I worked on everything. <laughs> so I've been, I started out drawing comic books in like the very, very late nineties. I'm that young. And um, uh, yeah, I made a career out of, out of, story, uh, out of uh, uh, telling stories with pictures ever since. So I'm, I'm in my 20 year career as a professional now, started in 2003. Uh, in 2000, I drew my own comic book series called Copec in Germany. Nobody knows it, luckily, and the internet is forgetting everything that happened back in the day, so that's great. Uh, and then I wanted to draw Spider-Man for Marvel. That was, my, that was my goal. It never happened, but that's okay. Uh, today, I'm a storyboard artist. I work on stuff like Horizon Forbidden West, worked on Hitman, Rise, Son of Rome, lots of other stuff in trailers. Uh, so yeah, it's still all about storytelling for me, and uh, my heart still beats strongly for comic books because it was my first love and um uh yeah i uh i uh yeah want to talk about comics how we put them together how we color them how we draw them what to think about we have three sessions this is the first of one and in the second one i will actually draw a page from a script and it's from a script that you will help create you out there on behands.net you will help create it which is really cool we got a little script uh, and you can bring your own hero, hashtag, and uh, and uh, uh, inspire us to draw something different than I would normally draw, maybe. That's um, awesome. Great. Well, the audience are very lucky because you know an awful lot about comics, and this is going to be a this is going to be a big session. So I, I know you're very eager to get started and get cracking, and a lot a lot you have a lot to say. So why don't you get this party started, class? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Uh, let's let's dive right in. I don't know if you can see my screen. I've already opened um, some yeah. um, some pages from 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 my GF Joe comic book. This was like back in 2010. This is a long while ago, but it still holds up because comics are a timeless media, right? They're not a genre. They're a media. They they can tell any story you like, and you can do it in every style that you uh, that you espouse that you like. Uh, I for one, I'm an American style comic books guy. Um, I, um, I love manga too, uh, children's books, illustrations, stuff like the Simpsons. There are so many different styles and ways of telling stories and it's, and it's really fascinating, but they have a lot in common too. And that is just like, how do comics function? We'll talk about this in the middle of today's session. At the end of today's session, I will go and draw a superhero. So let's see what I'll draw. Um, and yeah, if there are people in the chat who have questions, if you're on Behance, uh, uh, you'll be on the chat. You can ask me questions, and Molly will relay them to me. And um, yeah, let's 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 look at the comic book page and how it is set up before it gets too boring. Because we need to see action here. Um, so the question is basically, how do we get to a page like this? This was the the original. This is the cover for the comic book. I'm going to show you later how I draw another cover for GI Joe, uh, for another book that I drew. Um, uh, but we're gonna we're gonna focus on this page first. So um, how do we get there, or rather, how do we get here to to a page that is lettered? Because lettering is really important um, when it, an important element of comic books. It's not just drawing pretty pictures. It's how to tell a story with pictures. And comic books merge text and visuals. And I was in San Diego Comic Con, like 2001 was the first time I think I went. And uh, one of the editors at DC said to a whole uh, bunch of people on a big panel, he said, leave your art diplomas at home. I don't care about your apprenticeship in drawing comics and, and, drawing, uh, and drawing and rendering. I'm interested in whether you can tell a story with pictures. And that's all that counts. And your style, 
whatever way you draw is secondary as long as the audience understands what's going on. Um, when we talk American comic books, so really books like this, like really physical comic books, you can see it now. I have the cover here. I open it up. There's the first page. It starts on the right-hand page, and then it continues. And we're going to talk about these pages today, the beginning of G.I. Joe Origins number 11. I think it's still available in trade paperback. This is the physical, real edition from back in the day. Um, I think this will be a little bit harder to get. So uh, when we talk about comic books, we know they are printed and they are printed in, in certain sizes. So you have to look out for the scale of your comic book. Um, there's something that's in blue here that's called the safe area, or I call it the live area, um, where the most, most parts of the comic book lives. Everything that is in this, in, in this blue line, we can see it here, is, is basically the dialogue and, and, and the maximum of the panels, right? You see now, if I uh, reduce the opacity, you can see how all the uh, panels, those are panels, uh, the individual pictures are called panels, um, and it's always good to use the professional jargon. Um, and uh, yeah, they're all in the live area and all the dialogue lives in the live area. And, and then there's the green line, which is the trim line where stuff gets cut off for the comic book. And if we want anything to be cut off in the comic book, we have to, to draw until we hit the red, the red line, the red outline. So it's really nicely cut off and nothing, nothing bad happens because we want to have everything neat. We want to have everything in nice little boxes with an outline or we want to have stuff that bleeds out beyond the page and then we cut it off really neat and nicely. So um, a nice delivery, clean delivery of a comic book helps not distract us from the actual content of the page. And that's industry standard for American comics. I saw an address at the bottom, uh, blam, uh, blambot.com, which is a pretty familiar name for people in comics, but you, this can be downloaded there for people who want to make their own pages. Oh, absolutely. There are multiple sources for that. Um, Blambot is a lettering website. They, they care a lot about lettering comic books and they letter comic books professionally um, uh, for Marvel and DC. Um, I, um, they're, they're pretty new relatively. There's somebody who's called Richard Starkings who's a bit older in the, in the, in the business. And he has, he has basically invented computer uh, lettering. And this is an amazing book. Uh, I got it signed here by Richard which is super awesome. I met him at San Diego Comic Con. And this is a book about lettering, how it works. And it's super inspiring. Can really recommend this one. Um, but yeah, let's dive into, into making the page and taking it from a script uh, somewhere else into a, into a nicer, nicer looking way. So it starts with a script. Here's a script. Um, it's by JT, JT Kroll, amazing comic book writer and writer in general. Um, and this was the script for, for the Beachhead issue. Uh, Wayne Sneed, an army ranger, a really cool uh, hero from the G.I. Joe universe. Uh, his code name is Beachhead. And here we'll find out why his name is Beachhead. It's basically a pun. So it's, it's a really nice little story and there's a lot of action in there. It's action. It's not called action comics for nothing, right? So um, I'll go in a little bit closer here. And we see this is this is page two of the script. And so there's panel one, panel two, and panel three. It's a three panel page, so it's very, very simple. Average number of panels on a page in an American comic book, seven. Franco-Belgian comic book, which is A4 size, a little bit bigger, and published in, in Europe, 11 pages, 11 panels, sorry. So the so, audience is getting some proper insight here because this is the actual script that you were given to make the page that you're gonna take us through. That is, that is correct. Um, so we, we uh, open up on the first page. Uh, we see him lying like uh, unconscious at a riverbed and he's, he's going in and out of consciousness. And then we're going to, uh, to page two and that's why he says another close view on Wayne's face. Uh, he's lying in a hospital bed, his head is bandaged and his face is bruised. He's resting in a hospital gown under clean white sheets. But in this panel, all we see is his face resting on the pillow and his bandaged head. Let's see what I made out of this. Here he is. Close up, this is the sketch I made from this. This is These are basically the breakdowns. Um, this is already like basically sketch number two uh, because the first one is like really, really gritty. I don't know if you can actually see anything from that. Let me see if I can if I can find it real, real fast. 
and give you an example of how gritty it sometimes gets. Um, when was this comic made? It was 2008, did you say? Uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, some, something like that. Um, right, but you were working in pencil at least for your, for your sketches. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I was still working in pencil and then scanned it and imported it into Photoshop and then I was able to use all the overlays. Later on, I realized starting with Photoshop might have actually been easier because it gives me the right proportions and I can easily use the layers and the opacity to push it back and draw over it and use multiple layers and do quick iterations on the thing. However, drawing on a real page while having in mind that you're actually holding a physical copy gives you a really nice view of how big panels are and if it actually reads. So you see how, how really ridiculous my, my sketches look. You can barely see what's going on in there. So this is just for me, basically. So I'm not even sending this to an editor at IDW or on any comic book publishing company um, because this is just too rough. Here, it gets better. So I'm going to close this again. Um, we see uh, we have this close up. We have this done. And then we have something um, that, um, erase this here, it's distracting. Uh, that JT called a uh, three-quarter splash. A splash page is normally uh, a page that really goes into the bleed and cuts off everywhere. And that's called a splash panel. Normally we start a comic book and end a comic book with a, with, with a splash panel. And this is a three-quarter splash. So it's not the full page, just, but just makes up the majority of the page. And that's exactly what I did. There's very little dialogue on this page. So there was very little to take into account there. So their nurse says that the uh, jefe playa is despierto. So um, so the, the beach head, the guy with the head wound we found on the beach is just waking up, she says in Spanish. And um, so we have a caption here where uh, the, the narrator, which is mostly the main character, reminisces about like how it is to, to be in this situation and, and, and it gives us more information, more flavor about uh, what's happening there. And then there's panel three, close up on Wayne as he looks over and gets a distorted reflection of himself in the stainless steel siding on a bedside table. And he doesn't know who the hell he is. He's forgotten it. So we go into this page and what we see here already is that I have actually, in Photoshop, I went in and created a couple rectangular boxes, which are the captions and some ovals or semi-ovals uh, to, to, uh, to show the word balloons. They are really important when uh, compositing a page, and we'll talk about it a little bit later again. Um, so you can see here, that's a rough outline. You can see already everything is happening. This is basically storyboard quality. So these days, I'll leave it at that. And then other people make it into a wonderful CG animated trailer uh, or make it into a cutscene from a AAA video game. And I'm really happy because this is where the real storytelling happens for me. The rest is making it prettier. But comics sell when they're pretty. So we went ahead and did that. So I did this, this drawing, probably this is already like A4 size or A3 size because comic books are drawn in 11 by 17 American inches or uh, A3 size in European style, round about that. But you always have to take into account the real proportions that I showed you at the very beginning of this. Yeah, um, so, so that's a nice page. Um, what is there to say about the page? Not that much, um, I, I, I inked it out. I didn't actually ink it and made a new pencil drawing because drawing in ink is something you have to be have to really good handle for it. There's nothing like um, what do you call that in Photoshop? There's an option for that where you like make the line work nicer. In Germany, it's called Glättung. I I don't know what it's called in English. It's like a correction, right? So when you make, make a stroke, it gets really really nice. Um, that didn't exist. Um, I was I was still drawing with pencil and then. Uh, made everything darker in Photoshop, which is amazing and a great possibility. And from there, I went into um, creating flats or a friend of mine, probably Hi Gunther, probably created flats for that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, from there, we, we took it to coloring. And you can see the coloring adds a completely yeah. new dimension uh, to this image. I was able to use a blur effect in, in Photoshop on the on this um, on this part here, right? So this makes it look really cool. It looks really different 
uh, from before here i mean like this looks like there's another person there you know if you if you just look quickly and and now it's really a reflection we turned the lights on also outside and beyond the panel and that's one of the big um takeaways i hope you you get home is thinking outside the box also thinking outside the panel box the world does not end with your panel border if you, if you think big think wider especially when it comes to perspective and creating perspective but also there might be an influence from the outside the panel there might be a shadow that falls on a character from outside the panel or in this case the reverse there's a window actually in front and it shines light into the room and we see another window back here right and it has the same the same uh structure uh the same lattice structure uh that is that is here is also in the back um and if we turn it off it's gone right this entire impression of light and warmth and waking up in the morning is gone so colors are really important um for american style comic books We've, if you were doing this now, um, the chat pointed out, by the way, the term is smoothing, the thing that Photoshop does. Uh, would you, uh, I imagine now, nowadays, you'd probably do your inks uh, digitally, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, I, I would use Photoshop um, and, and uh, just use the layers. I mean, for storyboarding, it's really better. And a lot of artists, um, see a lot of artists these days international ones working for comic books use photoshop and draw and paint in there because you all can also have screen tone and it's it's really easy to make borders um so there's a lot of advantages to to doing this um and also you have uh, uh sometimes you can use perspective grids you know put them in there to make the drawing of the perspective easier and i mean like um on the third session i will dive deep into critiquing some artworks from some from some uh, friends who sent me something and uh, I'll be I'll be the first one to critique my own artwork so so I messed up on stuff as well for example like the perspective in this panel is not perfect I eyeballed that I did not do a vanishing point and have all the lines converge perfectly I eyeballed that I was like this is about here this is about here and then there's uh, something that you will not see in uh, in CG work and, and you will not see in, in storyboards because you don't have to finish it you can do whatever you want but in in comic books you're really pressed for time a normal comic book has 22 pages and they need to be drawn within a month maximum Good artists make 22 pages in less than 22 days. They make it in two weeks uh, and then it gets inked and then it gets colored by somebody else. And then their person with the expertise in storytelling um, dives into the next set of pages. By the way, storytelling, that's what we all do. It doesn't matter what you do. If you, if you scribble out, if you write the script, if you, if you thumbnail a page, if you ink a page, that helps with the storytelling. If you color the page, that helps with the storytelling. It if you're a lettering artist and put the word balloons in and, and the little sentences, um, you're a storyteller and it's a chain and the weakest link counts. So make sure that all your links in your production pipeline are strong. Um, here, for example, a uh, funny story, like, uh, do you see that? How, how much detail there's in the background still? So you see, there's another doctor. He is like checking the pulse of a patient. Here's another patient who's just getting up. Here's a nurse bringing some medicine, you know. Here's another doctor and talking to a patient probably, you know. You see the, the gowns are different. And she has a little pencil there. So there's a million things that help with the storytelling. Uh, smoking prohibited sign, something like that. This is for attaching stuff. Um, today, you can get reference from Photoshop, like uh, from, from the internet, super easy. And just incorporate it, draw over it, sketch over it, or just get inspiration. Uh, this story is taking place in, in Guatemala. And I had no clue what it looked like in Guatemala. Googling Guatemala hospital in 2007 is very different from doing it today. Believe me, kids. Wow. Well, what did you do then? You make stuff up. Right. <laughs> You, um, what, what you have to do is you have to imagine, uh, you, well, first you do get reference, right? You, you find some reference, you find some atmosphere. Uh, and, and then you go like, okay, we need to have this be very simple, right? So Guatemala is not that rich a country. So a lot of technology is looking different or is, is, um, is, is, is not as super high tech. This is not like a GI Joe hospital, right? This is a hospital that is in, in, in Guatemala. And so, so I put in there a really old cassette player. 
So they gave him a radio, really old cassette player. I think you can see it here. You know, this this texture. If you're old enough, you remember this texture and this type of cassette recorder. Um, uh, um, and yeah, I put I put in stuff in there that is really simple and not too high tech looking. Even this chair is not super high tech and modern looking. It looks even a little bit rundown because I added a couple a couple strokes a couple strokes here and made it really nice and rundown. Um, and also, what I did is I I. Uh, I try to make it, I try to put extra content into this opening shot, but also didn't want to draw too much. So drawing perspective is really hard. And the more things go into the into the background, you will see much, much more detail there. Um, so it really helps if you have a vanishing point, if you put something in front of it, like this dude. So this, this doctor here or this patient, is just there basically so i don't have to draw more detail back here and continue drawing the perspective all this um, trick in the book is there is there like a street or a car just stick a guy in front of it <laughs> absolutely stick a guy in front of it stick, stick another car in front of it never show the vanishing point actually hitting in your picture even if you draw a real perspective with a real vanishing point never show this don't have the street uh, go to the absolute end. You see that in film production, and uh, this comes into my storyboarding career indeed. So in film production, if you have a real film set, you always are at a curve at a corner, right? So the, the buildings always curve a little bit. This is for two reasons. A, it alludes to uh, a dynamic full city that continues behind the corner that you cannot see. And also, uh, you have to build a much smaller lot in order to shoot the movie because you don't have to do 15 houses. You do two, and then it curves coincidentally. Uh, funny that. And also things like the fact you thought about the chair, you know, that's a very, that's a fairly minor detail. And some artists might feel like they're maybe obsessing a bit too much if they're thinking that hard about it, but that's all contributing to the storytelling that you're trying to create here. Yes. And I'm uh, with the colors, uh, talking about colors for a second. I'm not the expert on colors, but um, as always kiss, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, the the rule applies here as always. So so this entire uh, these entire shots are basically in green, and uh, in green and orange. So even the the towels are coincidentally orange, and this this strip here on on this on this ward where he's lying is orange, and the curtains are orange. And here like some some I don't know what posters that, which are orange. His skin is orangey indeed. Uh, so it's all in green and orange, and I just maintained the colors for continuity sake. Um, yeah, and then the then the lettering come in, came in, and the lettering actually, if we hide the layers, um, let me see if I can I can do this. You see that they're actually at the same spot. So the lettering artist took my inspiration where to place it. Um, I actually placed, for example, a caption over here and made made it like this. Come down here, and then you look into the picture. He did it, or they did it. I think it's Neil Uyataki, but I'm not sure. Back in the day, from uh, from IDW, but the lettering artist here did a little bit differently. He put the last word balloon here. So there's another um, um, another uh, line that is constructed because we we go through three things. I'm going to talk about it in a second again. When we do a, a comic book panel, three things are super important. I'm going to reiterate it later. So it's the face, the hands, and the word balloons. Everything else is secondary or tertiary background drapery arms anatomy all that stuff but people look out for the hands because they're really dynamic you see my jazz hands being used here right this picture me looks automatically more dynamic when i say look out this is more dynamic than look out because there are no hands happening um so we need to be able to draw hands well and i i did a section i did a seminar in adobe live about drawing hands i didn't do it in english though so maybe we have to get get back to that one day. So there's another line created here. And what I, what do I mean by this? Is mean like we're going from a face to a work balloon, and then we want to go to the other caption, and we 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 come by we come by him right here, and we go there, and then from here actually to get to the next work balloon, we have to go via his face, and we actually track with his with his eyesight to the reflection and and then he goes like oh well there's a person there but i don't know who it is so waking up not knowing who the hell you are that is actually good storytelling here so i think this lettering artist has actually plus improved 
the page and the idea I had about this. And that's what I yeah already said. It's all teamwork. And uh, if you can make it better, you, you should. I hope this helps answer your question, Sandrina, who asked, how would typical comic book lettering be done as a font, as separate assets? I'm doing an action comic book type interface for 36 days of type, so I thought I'd ask. You're going to go generally into, into word balloons and text, but uh, Sandrina, if you have any uh, more specific questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll try to catch them. That's great. Yeah, maybe we can, maybe we can get into this. Um, so... So this is how a comic book page is basically created, go through these steps. It's, it's pretty straightforward, but you can see it's a lot of work for a page that is probably read in 15 seconds. Sheesh. Yep, that's, uh, that's how it is. And, and because it's read so fast, our drawings have to have an immediate read. They have to immediately be recognized. What is it I'm looking for? Strong outlines, uh, strong separation of foreground and background, uh, and just like a, a strong iconic read uh, really helps with this. Um, we stay with pictures a bit longer when they're more complex. We're gonna talk about it in a second. Um, but um, yeah, ideally they're really, the first read is really immediate and you know what's, what's going on. So um, as you can see, this is not theoretically an exciting page. Nothing happens. The guy lies in the hospital bed. So what's going on here? What we have here in st storytelling terms is an internal conflict. There are three types of conflicts. If you read uh, um, Ed Hook's book on acting for animators, there are three types of conflict. Uh, one is with another character, one is with the environment, and the second one is internal. And he has an internal conflict here. That's why this page is interesting. This is why this scene or this part of the scene exists. He wakes up and he does not know who he's looking at in the mirror. And that's interesting. So that's good writing. Uh, by the way, good comic book art is, is, is really good for selling one comic. Good writing is good for selling two comics. You only buy the second comic book if the writing is good. Um, let's dive into something like uh, like this here. Yeah, that's really good. So I showed you that. Um, um, I showed you um, how comic ba pages are um, are made up in terms of cutting them off and keeping everything everything nice and tidy. So here I have something called blue line paper. So normally we had that back in the day, comic book paper. Marvel would actually send it out to you, like I think free paper to draw on, right? And if not, you had to buy it yourself. Uh, everything was drawn physically on paper with pencil. And then it was inked by an inker who would not only trace the line, but embellish the lines, make them nicer to read, make them easier to read, add texture to it. That's what, in, what, the, what a good inker does. So it's not just a tracer. Every link in the, uh, in the chain counts. And so, so uh, this is a page um, that made... Um, let me see if I can if I can do this. I'm just gonna set the opacity down. We got it so easy see. now with Photoshop. Yeah, so you, exactly. had to, you had to order this paper or buy it, and now you could just bung it in <laughs> on a layer, and there you go. Yeah, yeah, you had to buy it. Or what? What I did back in the day actually was I had a light table. A friend of mine, hi Nick, uh, built me a light table, like a custom made light table in over A3 size, and I could prop it up, put a light under it, had a transparent. Uh, a glass pane. It wasn't glass. It was plastic or something like this. Um, and you actually actually had a light table. And you light tabled it through. Um, so so uh, yeah, Photoshop is basically a very modern light table. <laughs> um, if you can see this here in blue, do you see this? I think you do, right? It's I'm pretty faint, but we can see it. Yeah. A bit a bit stronger here. Oh, that's so this is this is our setup. We can immediately recognize the life area in the middle, but we can also see these little lines here. And um, American comic book uh, storytelling was standardized in a, in in a certain way because all the books had the same size, and you always had, as I said, around about six seven panels per page. So if you need to break down a page into panels, you have something called uh, if we see it here. This is called the gutter. That's the space in between the panels. This white space, it can also be black or another color. Um, and then we have the border here, right? So the borders make up the panels. In between is the gutter. And uh, in order to get to a quick decision, because you don't want to worry about like, okay, I have three 
um, I have six panels, for example. How do I make this up, right? And it's it's very easy if you do it if you do it via this method, right? Because you can just take a line here and take this line here, and then you basically have your first panel. Mm. Just make it like this, and and then you can do this again here, and pull it till here. And you have your second panel, and it's the same size. And and if we actually pull this down, you will see really quickly how this works, right? So I mean, in Photoshop, this is now super easy, super easy to do. Uh, but back then, this was really a nice help to discern, like if I have like three uh, panels in a tier, or maybe I have two panels in a tier. Um, when I say tier, I mean I mean layer basically. So, oopsie, excuse me. This would be another tier. This would be the second tier. And I might want to do a middle section here. So I'm, I'm going to take my ruler. I'm going to do it like this right now. And uh, boom, break it, break it down here. So now I have a, I have this. Bam. And maybe there's a, a, big, a big panel still. And I'm going to make it page width almost, right? So this is very nice. Um, six panel layout that we have now very traditional and again keep it simple please like don't don't if you don't know how to do it don't try round panels for example let me do this for a second let's do a round panel if you do a round panel which is which is nice every once in a while you have to show like a sniper rifle or you want to have um i'm editing putting in a contour right in boom contour here um that that's that's great that's okay um, but if you do it, you have you have um, you have dead area. So in terms of panel composition, this is now dead. You just wasted all this space, and that's not gonna look good. It might look okay if you have a word balloon here, but it's probably not gonna look super good. So you have to be very cognizant of of what you're doing with this thing, right? So if you really want to do a round panel and need this rounded shape, minimize this triangular ugliness of shape, right? And and throw it in more like this, or maybe even actually have to have it bleed out. And then we have to go outside of the bleed area. And, um, and then I can erase this. And now we have a rounded shape. That is okay. Hmm. That's okay. That, that's doable. So if you have a sniper scene, um, uh, as always in G.I. Joe, you have that, right? And then you have a person uh, just, just walking down on the sidewalk here. And you want, it, you want to shoot that person for some reason because it's a bad guy indeed. Otherwise, don't shoot people. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, uh, I love conflict. I draw gritty guys with guns, but I've never fired a gun in my life, by the way. So for me, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. I'm playing with this conflict and this danger and the action, but in real life, I'm really mellow and I really don't need that. <laughs> None of us do. Like horror artists who are really wholesome. Yes, yes, those exist as well. Um, so let me see where we're in time. Already half an hour has passed. I can't believe it. <laughs> Oh, it's been very educational. I guess there, I guess the key point you're making there, as somebody pointed out, oh, it's like a keyhole, ha, ha is that you want to kind of maximize the amount of space in the panel, right? Um, yeah, the, uh, the problem normally is that you don't have enough space for all the story you want to tell especially if you have time and you're not constrained by being a professional artist that needs to publish like a book, a full book of 22 pages plus cover a month or more, uh, then you can take some more time and add in more detail. So what other people do, like one of my favorite artists ever is Jim Lee. He's, he's an absolute legend, DC Comics. And before that, he founded uh, Image Comics, uh, absolute legend. Um, he always goes goes uh, goes outside uh, the life area. He always goes into the bleed because he has more to show. And that enables him to draw bigger and show the things bigger. And that's what we want. In uh, I'll talk about more about panel composition in a, in a second. But, but yeah, this is important for me to mention that there are tiers and we go through this and this is how we make up a page. And uh, normally, the, the big question is, um, how, do you, how do you make it exciting? For example, this page here. Um, 
Let me see. Yeah, we got the word balloons in there as well. So this is a standard comic book page. And we see those two pages are actually next to each other. The same size and they will they will go together, uh, which is which is really nice and it really works. Uh, so from this uh, tranquil scene here where he's waking up internal conflict, we're going to go to external conflict with the environment. He wants to go up. This actually happens in the second panel already. Here he tries to get up. Um, and, and then he's in a conflict with other characters and they sedate him and he falls back into sleep. And then we have a panel where we leave and then he's asleep and they go like, wow, this, these Americans, crazy Americans. Um, um, uh, they, uh, they, they're always like up, up to something. Um, so they had to sedate him. This is an interesting page because when I started this page, I knew it would, it would be six, six, uh, six panels. Let me see if I can open this again. So I basically knew we would want to have like a very simple composition here. So it's basically this. And I knew I didn't, I didn't want to go into the, into the bleed. And if I do like it's super quick job, quick dirty job, I, I've, uh, I don't do the gutter. Don't do this. Don't ever do this. Separate the pictures nicely with a gutter so we can see which one is which. Um, and uh, but this was, this was the idea. So um, I was, thinking about what do I have to draw in there? Um, and um, yeah, there's one rule that I have about comic drawing, and that is you go in as close as possible and as far away as necessary. This does not always work with storyboarding for video games and for films, so take it with a grain of salt. But for comic books, this has served me well. I always go as close as possible to his face, for example, in order to communicate, uh, in order to, to show the face bigger, to show more emotion in the face. Manga is fantastic at that. They always focus on the face. And then I show as much background as necessary. So for example, in this shot, even the writer knew background wasn't necessary because we're gonna have the background here. This is very different from film where uh, um, the panel or the, the view disappears to the, next, uh, to the next iteration because they are not, in storyboarding and in film, it's a sequence in time, and here it's a sequence in space. And space is time in comic books. So we have a big panel here, and more time passes because we got more detail to take in, and we also got empty area to, um, to, to relax. So I'm thinking when I'm looking at this page, he's trying to get up, the doctors and nurses come in, somebody comes from behind and they, they sedate him. Um, what do I do there, for example? Like the first panel I could have drawn could have been something like this. I'm thinking about he's in a bed and he's trying to get out. That's that's what I want to illustrate here. So, okay, let's 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 go with it, right? Hospital bed, cool, from the side. This is how like a child or me being, I don't know, 10 would draw this, right? Draw the ground, draw a panel. And here he is, and he's, he's getting up from, from his bed, right? And there's maybe some of this, uh, what do you call this railing, scaffolding? Railing, what is that? Yeah. Railing, yeah, the railing here to keep him inside to help him avoid uh, falling out, right? So, so he's in here, right? And then the nurses come in. But this is a very, very boring panel. Um, this, this is, this is, this horizontal lines um, create staticism. It's very static, um, and it's very descriptive. And we don't want descriptive. We want emotional. So I'm going in as close as possible. So. I will actually take this out and I, I realize, wait a second, I don't need this entire bed and the room in here. I basically just need this. So I'm going to copy paste this out and paste this in. And, uh, and I can do it. I can, I can put it in here and, he, and, he, and he's getting up. Oh, this is, this is great. There's no dialogue. I can just have him get up. You know, in storyboarding, you would put an arrow there in comic books. If you put an arrow, you failed. You cannot, you cannot tell a story with pictures. If I can't see from your drawing, the drapery, the action, the movement, if I cannot discern that he's moving, he's not moving. Also, this is done for children's books also, often like these speed lines. Yeah, that's nice for children's books. We're doing American style comic books, so we don't do this, except if there's actual smoke. So we try to avoid these, these lines. If kids' so, comics uh, do that, then they're kind of evoking uh, cartoon style as well. Yeah, you're talking about American comics, indeed. 
And uh, the the quote that you said, uh, Dennis asks, how much space do you do you want to show beside the subject? I suppose that would be exactly what you're talking about now, as close as possible, as far away as necessary. Wonderful. Yes, exactly that. But now we see there's a difference, right? Uh, this is the guy getting up from his bed. See the railing here? See a little bit of the bed? What's going on? That's not the same I selected. I mean, he's still like uh, has like an infusion still going in his arm. Um, I don't know if we established this. Yeah, we established this in this shot. So whatever you want to use later on, you need to establish at the very beginning. So you have to maintain continuity. Comic books are the best way of learning about continuity. And later on, if you do a storyboarding career like me, if you follow in my footsteps, um, you will need this. So you have to seed it first and then you can reap it later. You can harvest it later and use it to your advantage. Um, so I was like, okay, he's got these, he's, he's got the things here, right? That are uh, on an IV tube or whatever you call this. Um, yeah, that's that's a nice composition and it works, but it's not very exciting. And let's compare this to what I did. I did this. This is the first panel here. See what's happening here? How fast, how, how close in do I go? Very, very close. I go in so close that he's no longer in the frame completely. Why is that? Because he's leaving the frame. He's not leaving the bed also. He's also leaving the frigging frame. His head will continue outside here, right? And have a, have a face there. But I'm not drawing this. I'm skipping this. I'm not skipping this because I can't draw his face. Obviously, I can. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing this. And see how taut these lines go? These IV... Um, Drips. IV drip, yeah. Yeah, they they go taut here, right? And if you look at the script, I don't have it right here, but I don't remember it being in the script. This is often stuff that we storytellers, we comic book artists and storyboarders, we put into the imagery and into the thing. Uh, writers have an idea for dialogue and story com uh, composition and story arcs and emotional journeys and all that stuff. And we have to make it visual. And that's what I did here. So he's getting up. There's another uh, arm in the background here. You see how I reduced the detail in the arm in the background? I didn't even finish drawing the fingers there. <laughs> oh, Klaus, you're so lame. No, that's not lame. That is called creating depth. Because detail can't be everywhere on the page. We have to be cognitioned about where we place the detail. That's where the focus is. The focus here is on the IV tube getting, getting pulled, you know, and they don't want this and he him getting outside the panel then we have the next shot they're talking to him they caught up with him basically they noticed and he's we, we switch the camera to the other side we go behind the doctor here with the camera so we're now on this side here and they're talking he's trying to break free from this and somebody's coming in from the background so i'm already planting this guy and then i i have him here in in the panel if we look at the work balloons you also see how i put the work balloons in there and this is another part of making these uh making these stories work is knowing who talks and who talks when so i knew the doctor would talk first calma calma like cool down cool down here relax she says and then he says let me go so he needs to be in the uppermost corner right what i cannot do is um is is put our man in here in the bed really high up and then the doctor comes in maybe uh, perspectively like we're doing a, a low angle shot, right? And the doctor comes in from here and the way, and she comes in here, right? If she has, says, calma, calma, like this is gonna get difficult. This is gonna get difficult to, to place the balloons. So we have to be uh, aware of which character speaks first and how much they speak. I have another example from the same book in a second for you. There's a question from John Charles who asks, how far ahead would you plan when adding details for later panels? How far ahead? Well, um, sometimes it goes backwards, right? You, you don't play everything, you don't plan everything uh, from the very beginning. So often you, maybe I, I drew him lying in the bed there. And then I did the next shots where I realized, oh, he is getting up and he's got an IV that is gonna be pulled taut, you know? Um, and um, I have to check it whether it wasn't script really. It probably was because the, the writer is really good. Um, but so, so I realized that in this moment while, while I'm doing the sketch and then I go back and make sure that I planned it on the page before. So I don't always have to plan because drawing comic book is a 
drawing comic books is a process and it goes really from rough and sketchy and the first ideas to improving, to improving, to improving, and then making sure everything is coherent. And uh, yeah, that's, I think that's important to notice. It's not just like you sit down and you draw the lines and they're perfect. Almost nobody does it that way. And it almost never works except your Kim Jong -ji, Kim Jong-gi, the amazing artist that uh, died earlier this year, I think um, he did that. They called him the, the human plotter. He was just, printing like a machine and it would work and it would be fantastic but he's one in the million and i'm just standard yeah the so rest of us have to me. do a could try a couple times <laughs> yes yes we do so i did something else here and you, you can see it a little bit um do you notice that that this um this the panels are not actually broken up like this they're not perfectly the same size i switched a little bit so panel two got a little bit better a bigger panel three got a little bit bigger. Why is that? Why did panel, um, no, actually those are in the middle. This is, this is good, but panel three got a bit bigger. And that is because there was more dialogue. So dialogue has an impact on the size of your panels. There are actually four things that have an impact. I'm gonna talk about it in a second. Um, but I want to address something that, that I'm, I'm, I'm happy with too, which is the last panel here down there. Um, that is a, that, that's a nice one as well. Um, let me see if I have the um, the rough for that um, page two, three, four, five. No, I don't. I don't think I have the roughs right here. Um, but yeah, the um, this is very graphical. Oopsie, Photoshop just did something. I was on the wrong layer. So you can see I'm playing with the gutter here, the the railing that I established before here. It's a very recognizable shape for hospital beds. I use that. Um, to frame him. I use that to create a graphic interest. Even though this panel composition is pretty boring by some standards, some people want like flashy pictures, uh, fl flashy panels that are round and like skewed and distorted and have weird, weird uh, borders, for example. I don't do that. I concentrate on the story and I concentrate on, uh, on making it interesting nonetheless. So this is a really uh, maybe smart way and inspiring way for you out there to sometimes go beyond what is in the panel and play with the medium a little bit. I know Molly, you're a comic book artist as well, and you have you have sketch out comic books and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's it's fun, right? You do it too, like working with the panel borders and just um, yeah, playing with the medium a little bit. Indeed, yeah, and that's a that's a, that's a. That's another trick as well, the, how your uh, gutters alternate. You should not make them uniform to keep it kind of interesting and prevent it from being very static. Yes, except except you want it to be very setting, except you have a you have a thing yeah. where there's the character and he's looking at you and he's, he keeps on looking at you and then he makes a decision and says like, yes, right? That's very static and we want the repetition and we want to have that stuff in there. Even though this composition I did here, not very good. But for, for that scene, it actually would have worked. Um, another thing I want to talk about this scene is the changes of perspective in this. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, gonna, gonna erase this really quick here. So um, just, just, just looking at this. So this is basically, this is first, it's a close up. It's a close up. Uh, and we have even horizon. And then we continue with the even horizon, but we now do a medium shot. Uh, then we do a, a half medium, basically, and we still say, going like this, then we do an extreme close-up. Uh, and then we go to an overview shot. We look, we look down on him actually. And from there, we actually look up into the sky. It's a low angle shot looking up here. So we see the two people being over him. He's down, they're literally over him. And I place them in the picture above him, their heads. Again, the heads count and the word balloon counts and maybe the hands and the rest nobody cares about. I don't need to show them standing with the, with the bat there. So I could have done a shot like this where it's very simple and we do like the even horizon again and he's in the hospital bed and he's lying down here and he's unconscious. And I, I do some perspective lines in there, perspective of the ceiling. I could have done this and then have the doctor here and you have the nurse here, but this would have been very boring. It would have been maybe good because the action calms down and we want it to be static and boring, this would have been a possibility. But I opted to do the fancy stuff and incorporate the gutter into the graphic design of the panel border. So I did that there. Um, and yeah, Klaus from 12 years ago, you did okay there. 
<laughs> There's a question from Michelle. Uh, do you use borderless panels? And if so, what are some guidelines for using them? Hmm. Very good. Yes, I do use borderless panels. I don't know if I have anything here right now in my files where I talk about this, but I can come back to that yet, uh, tomorrow for sure. Um, but I don't have examples for that. So borderless uh, panels are really nice because they pop out because they don't have a border. And we have to be careful though how they bleed into the background. Um, for example, this panel here could have been a borderless panel. You see, there's not really anything that's that's happening in this. So if I want to make this panel borderless, for example, it's getting, oopsie, it's getting a little bit tricky, but I'm going to try it in Photoshop right here, right now, because I want to answer your question. That's what we're here for, right? Um, so I'm going to draw over this and just take away the border. So this is still a close-up, so it has to end somewhere. And wherever it ends, we have panel border. So this is one thing I could have done. So this is now a borderless panel. And as you can see, it immediately gives this panel more attention. It becomes more interesting. It will become even more interesting if I don't cut them off like this, because this doesn't really look good. I will actually go in and continue painting him. Let me really quickly and dirtily uh, do this in Photoshop because it's possible. You can do so many experiments just because we have layers and we're not confined to, to a physical pencil. So this works, for example. That's a possibility. And now we have it. Does that make sense? I hope so. Yeah, Michelle says thank you. So I think you answered her question. Very good. Uh, one thing here, and it's really important, um, we do not jump tiers. So we don't normally have one tier intersect with the other tier above, except you really want to have the eye go down there. For example, this is already now leading from this word balloon a little bit into this. It can get stronger. So if, if you're like a fancy pants type artist and goes like, you know what, I'm just going to have him like, I'm going to draw the entire head just because I can. And it's Photoshop. This is really cool. So I'm going to draw it over here. Just going to finish the head here and make it really simple. Because I'm, I want to show him he's got interesting hair. If you read the story, you know what's going on with his hair later on. Just going to tease you. Spoilers. Spoilers. I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but just going to tease people. So what happened now? This is great, right? Oh, we can see the entire head. It's so nice. It's an it's an open panel. It also like overlaps with that. Yeah, that's that's great. But now we have a problem. We have a big problem actually, because we're going from this panel to this panel. And then from here, I'm going here because it's intersecting and I'm going here, but no, no, I missed this. Now he gets sedated before the other people don't manage to you know, keep him restrained. This is not what we wanted. Only because you can do it in comic books doesn't mean you should do it. You should always be aware of what's happening. For the same reason, this work balloon here, let me see if I can copy paste it out real quick. Um, there should be uh, the quick selection tool from Photoshop. Should make this super easy, Oop, like this. And I'm just gonna go Control Z, Control V, Control T. Right. I would never place a work balloon up here. And then I'm gonna put a border on it. Really easy. Uh, just work with it. Add contour, contour fill, and I'm gonna go like four pixels and put it in the middle. Boom, here we go. Uh, I would never do this because that would mean that uh, our attention goes from this panel and it's being actually, it's actually being led from the work balloon to the focus area. This leads us down, right? A little bit and leads us down to this thing. That's not good. Some German comic books back in the day have done this and I don't know why they did. I mean, they had access to American comic books too and they, they never did it. Um, so, it's a bit of a learning curve finding out what to do and what not to do when uh, when telling a story with pictures, especially in this in this way of doing it when you when you juxtapose panels, right? When you when you put them next to each other and they don't they don't follow in the sequence, and that brings me to um, to Scott McCloud for ah. a second. We've done so much drawing now, 
And so Scott McLeod wrote a book. I think you have it. You have it, right? I do. Yeah, I've got a copy of it right here. It's the Bible for a comic book artist understanding comics. And I actually met him in Amsterdam and I got him to sign it. He's such a lovely guy. Not only does he know everything there is to know about, <laughs> about comics, but he's also incredibly sweet. He, he is. I met him too at a, at a comic book conference or in a, a book conference actually in Leipzig one day and got, got my copy signed. And he defines comics as uh, juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. That's a big load. So juxtaposed means they are put next to each other, right? And we have pictorial and other images. So some images are just like things you can discern from life. Okay, this is a tree. Uh, this is smoke, for example. We know what that is. But there are also other images. And other images are, for example, word balloons. And they are letters. And they are arbitrary icons. Icons we agreed upon that they have meaning. And if we don't know how to how to uh, understand a language, then we cannot understand the meaning behind it. So if I, if I just write a wor word in here, if I just write this here, Kara, you don't know what the meaning of that is. I mean, if you're Spanish, you know, el ca la cara is the face, right? So uh, super easy, you immediately recognize that this is the same thing as a smiley face uh, or as any face. Um, so we have, yeah pictorial and we have other elements and they're in a deliberate sequence and that's funny right we just talked about it we need to maintain control over the deliberate sequences that we create on the page and if you don't do this if you confuse your uh your viewer your audience your reader uh you will lose him and it doesn't matter how great your art is how amazing your colors and rendering is or how great your story is you will lose him so we really have to keep it simple um, what, what about in terms of cinematography? Uh, Sandrina asks, uh, do you think in terms of cinematography, like trying to simulate dolly zooms or arc shots or things like that when you're drawing? Dolly zooms and what? Uh, arc shots, etc. Arc so, shots. So cin cinematography um, uh, principles and bringing that into your comics. Do you think in those terms when you're uh, figuring out how to, how to create your images? Well, I know, I know one thing. So in storyboarding, there's something called the 30% rule. So that means like every, every frame that you draw, every shot you construct should be at least 30% different from the one before. So you don't do close up and then do another close up from a slightly different angle. This is going to be like this. And then the person looks like this. It's, it's weird. It's, it's called a jump cut. It's not nice, right? So you have to change a lot. And then you have to change the aspect ratio of it as well. So you change from a close up, for example, you, you, you change to a medium shot and you change to a wide shot. And this is something that I'm taking in the comic books as well. Because if everything looks the same, uh, it's really boring. I think I had a really old um, page from the Phantom comic book. Everybody knows the Phantom. Uh, it's it's basically um, it's basically Batman in mixed with Tarzan in the jungle with guns. Um, so it's a really cool character. And here's a really old page, like from the 40s or 50s, um, uh, and uh, the Japanese. It's 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 pretty racist actually. So it's it's politically correct, I think. Um, it, it doesn't hold up, but it's it's a it's a thing of its time, right? But also, this a thing of its time was the the weak storytelling that they did back in the day. This was actually published as a strip, so actually there's only one tier normally published in a newspaper like Garfield, but it was an action comic. We barely have this these days anymore. Today, all the comics are funny, haha types comics, and they are not these action comics anymore. So if you have if you have panels where um, everything is the same size it's boring it really you really notice it when you have a juxtaposition of panels like this and the problem here is is not that um for example if i just look into this and make it smaller so i make it actually like the way it was delivered back in the day so you have like three panels like this you see and yeah, it works now. I think we can see it. Uh, the problem here is that Phantom is like the same size in all the pictures. 
even like the way his his uh, his foot is cut off there would have been much nicer if we had had uh, a smaller figure here and just have him like run like like uh, like like crazy into 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 in, into the action um and then have a shadow under him or something something like that would have been nicer to do but they didn't the artist didn't have that vocabulary yet um and they just try to illustrate what is going on and there's a lot of uh, captions here that that try to enhance what's going on so we see him getting up here and it says the phantom is on his feet in a flash well this doesn't really look like it's in a flash right it's not <laughs> super fast why is it not super fast i can't tell you why uh we can do a draw over real quick because it's fun like that and then i'm going to draw uh something else so why is he why is this sorry black yep why is this shape not illustrating or showing that he's up in a flash because his knee is actually not getting up it's looking like a light jog that he's doing here his his um, demeanor his anatomy his movement has not been pushed really so this is something that i would do like we see the head is still over the shoulders that makes it not very dynamic i'm gonna reduce the um transparency here a little bit more kind of looks like he's walking through mud Right. So even like also like this is a, a side shot and we just established at the very beginning, if we do a side shot, it's always very childlike and very informational and very calm. And we don't want calm. We don't want this. So if I have to redraw this panel, I would have him start. Actually, if I want to have the sideways um, imagery and maintain that, right, I would I would start with a head that is that is definitely lower than the body. And then the shoulders. I would I would do this. I would raise this arm really high. And then I, I would make him like this. I would open up his fingers more. Like the fists are always a sign of status static, right? The fist is basically a circle. And whenever you have a fist, nobody runs like this, right? It's, nobody runs. Everybody knows who has seen Naruto knows we have to run with our arms extended to the back. You're an animator, so you know this, it right? You go Molly. faster, yeah, if you Naruto run. It, it makes you go faster. But that's yeah, too now, fast, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't want him to be too fast, right? Um, so so here he is, the Phantom. Um, and um, so we here, here we have that established already. Uh, with my anatomy uh, memory, I can make it a little bit better. So his, his left arm is to the front, so I'm going to put his right right leg to the front, which which the artist also did. But if I do this, actually, this is still this, as you said, like walking through mud. He's yeah, he's uh, the ghost who stalks. But this the upper part is dynamic, but the lower part is not dynamic. So that's kind of sad. Uh, let's not do this then. Let's make it. Let's give it more action. Let's make it more extreme. And this is what comic books really excel about. So we want to want to lift the leg up here. I'm actually going to put this leg up in the air so the foot is free. And then I'm going to extend this his butt cheek here and extend this all the way back here. And he, he's taking the table with him, right? So so I want to make that super exaggerated. I'm going to take have the have the table here. And uh, he, he's he's using the table with like one leg. There's still a table on it. Boom, and he and he slaps it on his enemies there. So I will, I will do this. So I this didn't is even the notice he was carrying the table. I thought it was in the background. No, that is actually, that's not, that's not the case. Um, and this you is how we joke table for two. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Great puns. Great puns from the, from the 1980s. And we have this horizontal, we have this horizon line up here, right? So it's a, it's a high horizon line, highly placed eye level. Uh, wherever the horizon is, that's where our eyes are. And uh, that doesn't look very dynamic. So if I, if I put the horizon up in here, it doesn't look very dynamic. So what would look much more dynamic would be something like a, like a Dutch angle. So I'll do this on another layer now so, so I don't get bogged down in this stuff, right? I could actually make it like this. I could make it a Dutch angle so he looks even more dynamic. And then have like the, the palm trees in here because that's a jungle in the background. And then I'm going to put the jungle, more jungle here. I'm going to darken it all up. Whoops, sorry. So this is going to be the jungle. This is going to be the, it's going to be the horizon. 
going to put some grass here, some grass, and I let it go from big to smaller. So I give it more depth. I right, stop rendering. I'm not going to render grass everywhere. That's not good. Also careful where you place the grass. If you make it stick out too much, there's too much attention on the corner of the, of the panel. And we want to avoid the corners of the panel as much as we can. This guy is starting from the corner of the panel. That is not really good. That is not ideal. So if I was smarter, I would like tilt him a little bit. Um, but that's actually, that's actually, it's not really relevant for, for what we're doing right now, right here. So we have a really dynamic looking figure now. It's gonna, gonna kill this here. And if I really want to have the fist, I can do this, but um, yeah, gotta be, gotta be careful with that um, and not, not use fists too much. And now I'm gonna go in and erase the background where he was. Super easy, barely an inconvenience. And here we have a panel that is much more exciting. Does this make sense? Yeah, that looks that looks so much better. And it's funny as well because I mean, uh, a lot of Phantom comics are really, really well drawn and well done. It's just this particular one, something yes. something went wrong. I guess they had to they had to knock them out really quick or something. Uh, well, they did, and and people didn't have readily uh, this access to to anatomy books and anatomy photos, and they couldn't. There was, I mean, film still already existed, right? Black and white film in the 1950s, or maybe even color, but um, it 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 wasn't as readily available as today. Today, if you don't take reference, what's your excuse? And your excuse cannot be that he didn't have enough time, because using reference will actually save you time. And uh, so we have a Dutch angle here. It's, it's diagonal, right? The horizon is not horizontal. By the way, I just heard that the Dutch angles actually, the Deutsche Winkel, D German. The Americans just misheard Dutch, Deutsch, and thought it was Dutch, but it's actually German from the German movies from that area from the 40s, the black and white, uh, these art movies, you know, they used a lot of weird angles experimenting uh, with storytelling techniques. And, uh, and that's where the term comes from. So if you tilt the horizon, you're doing a Dutch angle, but it's actually a German angle. Oh, they, they took it from you. <laughs> they, they did, they did, but I, but I don't mind this, right? So let's look at the before and after. Yeah, I think we plus that a little bit. I think that's a little better. Spoiler alert, um, critiquing artwork always much easier than actually drawing it yourself. Drawing it yourself, coming up with the idea, coming up with the composition, that is hard work that takes a lot of uh, brain power and a lot of time. And it's much easier as an art director to go in there and go like, okay, let's let's push this a little bit. Um, if you're lucky, uh, you thought of everything, but you might always forget something. And that, that is just something that happens. Okay. Dennis has a question, which is, is there a reason why mangas do side views of characters so much? <laughs> um, maybe there is, um, for me, I would say, um, yeah, I do that too. I love that. I didn't do that on this page, right? There's barely a profile shot in here. There's actually low angle shots and high angle shots. And, um, yeah, this is difficult to draw. Um, when I started out, I think when I drew my first fan comics for Saber and the Star Sheriffs, I would, you know, like I, I can crank out a profile in like seconds. You know, it's like really easy to draw and the proportions are all there. And it's, it's, it's really easy to draw that for me. Like I've done this so many times, um, but it's, it's, it's relatively easy because the proportions are all the same. Now let's see how I do with a perspective shot. I actually have to draw the oval because I can't do this out of my brain, right? And then um, let me zoom in and watch, watch one man fail. Um, doing this now constructing actually the head and the nose and now see like parts of the eyes are now obscured we have the nose here we have that the mouth is rounded more now because everything is, is rounded do it doing this face the, the eye pops in here and there and then we have to draw the chin and everything has to be in, in perspective um the, the, the jawline, for example, like the ear is no longer up here, right? Normally the ears on the, where the, where the eyes are, but now it's not because the, it curves down here. So perspective drawing, putting the ear down here, putting the eye up here. 
You see how long this takes? It's already twice the time. And this is just a guy looking up. It's nothing spectacular. And it's probably not really in a proportionally amazing and abstracted in the most in the most perfect way. Even I still struggle with that. Give him some jawline here, have the chin in there, and then put, put a shadow underneath it here. And then he's looking up. So, um, and then we do, we do this, right? Give him, give him a color here, for example. Let's show, see, he's looking up. He's got a color here, same character, but now the character is looking up. It looks kind of spooky now. Um, but yeah, this is much harder to draw. And if I flip it horizontal, which is a great tip you should always do uh, in Photoshop, it's super easy to do. Uh, in, in real media, you have to hold it against the, the light and the page. And then you see, oh no, I messed up the proportions. Here the proportions are relatively okay. I think there's more back of the hat is more possible. And I think there's a little bit too much, too much here. And this also can be reduced a little bit. So it's, so it's, so it's, so it's nicer, right? So nostrils are visible here. So this is, uh, this, as you can see, takes me like, three, four times the amount of time and brain power than just drawing this. And um, so if if you're a beginner artist and you have to draw a character that looks up, this is what they do. Oh, there's a thing up here, right? Like, oh, right? There's a thing up here. But which one is more expressive? It's definitely that one. Definitely that one. Because we can also like, do a low angle shot and we can see uh, the ceiling over the character. And we have this great idea, I can pull the shoulder to the front. And here you just don't have that, right? And, and the ceiling in the background is horizontal because it looks up. So two shots, same communication, very different uh, outcome and quality and an emotional impact. And that's what we're going for. So I suppose it's a it's a time constraint. Speaking of speaking of time, we've got roughly 20 minutes left of the stream. There's a lot of compliments on what you're talking about and people saying it's very interesting and they're learning a lot from it. If anybody if anybody has just tuned in and they're not aware, if you go to behance.net slash Adobe Live, you can join the conversation and hopefully you can ask Klaus questions, but we'll have to see uh, how much how much time we have left because you've still got quite a bit that you want to cover, I believe. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to start drawing now. I wanted to do a superhero drawing. Yes. I mean, like heroes come in all sizes and shapes, right? And uh, G.I. Joe is indeed the real American hero. So I had to start with, with these guys because I drew for it. I didn't, haven't drawn Superman yet. I mean, actually, I have drawn Superman for a storyboard for, um, for a video game. Um, but that's a different story. Um, but I haven't drawn him in, in comic book form yet. And when we come to, to Superman... Um, we love Superman flying, right? That's the, the coolest thing, especially uh, comic books back in the day were a special thing because you could do special effects. You could do special effects that were not possible until they did the first Superman movie and you will believe a man can fly with their fantastic visual effects. That was like 30 years ago or more. And the new movies, you can do everything with Marvel, but back in the day that wasn't possible and comics were really special in this. And... Um, I have a drawing of Superman flying here. Here we have Superman flying, uh, full page width panel. That's really nice. Uh, Jim Lee, Jim Lee drawing. I just, just found this online. I liked it. I was like, wow, this is a really cool panel. And normally there would be like work balloons in there and captions and all that. And this might be the last shot of a, of a comic book or the first one or a really important page with a page, uh, um, a splash page panel um, in the book where he like, jumps into action and goes long and this is like wow this is where we see him in full body shot it's so amazing and this is the easiest page to draw this is the page in the comic book that has the most impact everybody will flip back to this page everybody flipping through the book will go like whoa he can fly that's amazing um what people don't don't look for uh let me see if i have this i have i have this i have this page here Sorry, I, I don't know who the artist is off the top of my head, but it's a really good artist. So let's open up this page right here right now and close the, the G.I. Joe ones. So check out this page. This is Clark Kent. He's also Superman. He's also doing super stuff. So um, which page has more impact? Definitely the splash page with Superman flying. Which page is much, much harder to draw? The one on the left. The one on the left is where... 
aspiring comic book artists fail and and run into walls where things get complicated. Look at all the uh, all the detail that is excuse me all the detail that is on this table here. Look at how you have to draw be able to draw drapery. Um, folding clothes like gravity like he's sitting on his chair right the chair has to be correct in perspective in some way you know there's there's a table um everything is 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 in front and in the back um it's it's really something and you have to look out for um for everything that is that is really storytelling related right because we see this very good here in the in the lettering there's a lot of words on this page so this page was, page was hard to uh, accomplish for the team of artists here. We have, and now I should be drawing something, but it's not working. Nope, it's not. I'm on the right page. I have the pencil. Hmm. And now it appears there is a lag going on. Wonderful. So um, we have these, wow, the lag is intense. What is happening there? Do you still hear me? Yeah, you're still here. Am I still online? Something something has happened here. I don't know with my with my Photoshop. If not, I have to have to I have to restart it. But this is not. Yep, it's not working. Um, we're losing valuable time here because I have so much to talk about. <laughs> um, now it appears. I don't know what that is. I'm going to close this. Uh, it's Lex Luthor trying to stop you. It, it must be Lex Luthor trying to stop me. I don't. I don't know what's 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 happening on these. Uh, maybe you have too much. No, see, it works. It's really nice. Um, I'm gonna open up the page again and see if we can get through it, and then I can do a really quick 15 minutes superhero drawing. So let's see how this works. Again, this page it doesn't want to do it. If I do it here, no problem. If I do it on this page, not working. What's happening? What's going on there? Maybe Try it's a really big file or something. Yeah, maybe. It's not a huge file or anything. It's really small. Let me see if I can copy paste this out. Oof. See if I can, yeah, I can put it in here. And now I can draw, yeah, now I can draw over it. That is interesting. The wonders of technology. This indeed never happens when you draw with a pencil, right? When you draw with a pencil, there's always going to be a pencil line. And uh, yeah, so this is this is some of the intricacies of technology these days, but we have to work with it. It's fine. I still uh, still love Photoshop from the bottom of my heart because it saved my life so many times and makes my job so much easier. Just explaining this on, a, on an overhead projector, so difficult. So um, we go through the word balloons and you see how this works here, right? This is really good. This is really good storytelling, really good composition of the panels. Um, he has a monitor and he doesn't know what to write. Uh, and now he has to write something and has to be super fast doing it. Um, and Perry White, his boss is getting on his case. So yeah, this is an interesting page and this takes a lot of time and effort in order to, to make this happen, in order to draw this. You can even see that um, we're a bit distracted now by the size of it, but you can see how it's it's cut off, right? It, it bleeds into the into the border of. If I open up again, we can see it better. It bleeds into the border of the cage, so it was drawn through to the bleed, and in printing, whoa! This is this is really a file that is corrupted. There is something happening there. I don't know. I'm not going to open this again. <laughs> First, yeah. It's called Adobe Live for a reason. We're live and stuff just happens. Um, so yeah, it's it's cut off. Uh, yeah, really interesting page. Are there more questions in the chat or can I just go uh, and and try a superhero drawing? Uh, Michelle is asking what your uh, what drawing tablet you're currently working on. I'm working on a Vacom Intuos 4 or something like that, uh, A4 size. Um, I've been using it for around about 10 years. This is my second Wacom tablet. I like that they're flat and I can actually sit up straight and look at the monitor. That's why I'm always looking at the monitor. Here, I can always look at the camera. Um, and yeah, so, so this enables me to sit straight. It's better for my back. If there was a glowing monitor here, I would, I would have to do this. And also drawing on the monitor will not enable me to do that. So if I'm on the monitor, my hand will be right there 
right here over this box coming down. So in Photoshop, I'm just, my, my hand is just this tiny little arrow. So that's why uh, I like working like this better than doing anything else. So let's do a cool, uh, cool opening shot of Superman. Let's draw a Superman panel here. And I'm just gonna do a page width panel up here and make it really fast. And we're trying to make it exciting. Open up a new layer. And I'm gonna construct Superman here. So if I, if I wanna have Superman flying off from the ground, um, yeah, I, I can just do this, right? I can just do his body here. There's feet there, always nice to have these non-stretched out feet that always looks terrible. So always nice to stretch out the feet like a ballerina. And then he flies up. It's still very, very stiff. And here, here goes his cape, right? And that's nice. Um, yeah, that's him flying up. This is the ground. This is boring. This is not really good. We want to show more. We want to show more action. We want to show more drama. So uh, I will construct a figure where I take care of the face and the hands and the word balloons are secondary on this one. We're just going to pop them in somewhere else. So uh, I want to have, I want to be as close in as possible, as far away as necessary. So the question is how much of the environment do I actually want to show? So first I want to show his face real big because it's Superman and he's awesome. So I want to have him slightly from below. And uh, here's nice eyebrows, nose, very, very simple, squinty eyes, never forget the hair. And I'm going to go in really rough and dirty now because I don't have time. 15 minutes for com composing this frame. Yeah, this sounds like something I would do if I drew comic books for a living still. You have to be fast in putting these out. You, you don't have time to, to think so much about what's going on. I give him a big chin. That's awesome. Strong cheekbones, really sexy. Uh, have a little bit of ear here. Never forget the ears. Don't, uh, don't leave out the ears. It's important. So this is cool. That's his face. That's great. And now I want to have like a super perspective exactly on there now. You can already see what's happening. My fist is getting super big if it gets close to the camera. I can be in the same posing, but further away from the camera. My fist is tiny, but it's always the distance to the camera that is relevant for how much something gets bigger. So I will, I will actually start with fist here with a hand. One, two, three. And the other one will be here. And now we can already imagine what the arms and the body looks like, right? Super easy like this. Just going to do it super, super bad. And maybe this goes actually bad, back to him. And then we have his body, right? And then uh, we have another block. We have one block that is his upper body. And then we have a second block, it's a bit smaller, which are his, his uh, pelvis area. And then we have blocks for the, for the legs, right? And it's all either um, cylinders, uh, like in this case, or it's, or it's angular blocks. And we're just gonna do this and have him fly here. So this is already, okay, looking like something, but it's not very dynamic yet. So we wanna we want plus this, we wanna make this more epic. And doing this, we have to know a little bit of, the, of anatomy. Uh, if you've done this for 20 years like me, that will come naturally. So that's, that's good. But I'm, I wanna focus on the fist first. So the fist, and I'll make a, in English UK stream masterclass about hands at some point. So the hands are not, the fingers are not all the same. They're not straight like this. It's really hard to make them straight. Normally, like there's one of the fingers is, is, is sticking out a little bit more and you can see the curvature of my hand in there. So there's a strong curvature. I'm going to do that. I'm going to pop out this finger a little bit and have the thumb come in here. See the nail here. That's his thumb. This one, we can see a little bit there and it's it's gonna get closer and uh, smaller here because we have want this nice, nice curvature. This connects nicely to what you were talking about earlier that the face is very important and then the hands are, are also important and then everything else is just kind of there to reinforce the storytelling. Exactly that. And now I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make him have the arms straight really, but I wanna give it more three dimensionality. So I do his deltoids, I allude to his, upper underarm here, lower arm, upper arm, anatomy, and, and we're getting to superhero territory here. So people are buff and that's cool. We can do this. We can exaggerate. It's a power fantasy, right? It's superheroes. Let's have fun with that. So give them like ginormous shoulders. Never forget this part here. This is really important. Um, the, um, what you call it in English? The, the back muscles. The back muscles on the neck? Yeah. Yeah, this one, yeah. 
um, I don't know all the all the terms for that in all languages, um, but yeah, that's important to to keep in there. Um, Going to erase this, give him a massive chest. Always have a middle line. It's really good if you have that. Goes here, and then then stuff will disappear. Um, his his uh, his midsection will probably disappear a little bit more here. And this is where the, the shield would be, right? The shield with a big S. And uh, I never realized it was an S until I was like 15 or something. As a oh, kid, really? there was a, yeah, there was an it was an abstract sign, right? It's like this and then it's this size. So I didn't understand it for some reason. It was just a cool sign that was up, was on there. Um, so yeah, for me, I, I never knew that that was an S. But I'm not going to put like both legs out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one leg to the front. So I'm gonna give him his, his, his trademark red underpants. And um, the chat is informing us that it's either uh, trapezius or deltoids, this part. Thank you. Yeah, it's the trapezius in the back and the deltoids are the shoulder one. Yes, never let out the trapezius in the in the back. That's, that's, that's important. So this is coming to the front. This is going to the back. This is his knee. This is, we show a little bit of his foot here. Foot goes back to his butt and um, and we have the feet here, and then we're gonna, gonna tuck this in a little bit more so it looks more dynamic. And then I have the second leg come out here with the knee and with the leg going smaller. And I'm gonna put this all into perspective a little bit. So this already looks super dynamic. This is this is good. We're getting somewhere. Can put in some shading here while I'm sketching stuff out. Keep in keep in mind shading and keep in mind lighting. Um, for example, sometimes you would you would draw something and you would draw all the the intricate little details of the of the suit, and then a colorist would come and go like, oh yeah, by the way, there's all shadow here, and then it doesn't read. You can save a lot of time by placing uh, the shadows first in your thumbnail sketch. This is a thumbnail sketch, um, and uh, and uh, uh, yeah. You don't want to waste time because you you have to draw a page a day minimum and it has to be final and it has to look good. So we uh, we put another fist here. We're using the fists now because he's ready to fight. Otherwise, I wouldn't do this, right? I would open up the hand and make him like like fly like this. That's really nice. And the, and the, the other hand in the background can can be can be opened up nicely, you know. So so it looks really dynamic. But now I'm going with this. Superman is attacking some some enemy, and uh, then we want to have the fists. Otherwise, avoid the fists. Super biceps, that's great. Have a nice latissimus here. And uh, give him like, he has a little bit of stripes here, I think underneath that thing. And then here he has the, the super, the red super, super suit. So now something happened here um, that I totally didn't plan for. And it's border breaking. So his 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 knee is coming out of there, out of this out of this frame, and um, now my question is, what is I don't have I haven't drawn the cape yet. Uh, I'll do it like really quickly in a second. Um, the question here is, and we're almost at the end, right? Um, the question is, what is closer to us, his knee or his fist? Well, the fist. It's the fist, right? So we want to have the fist border breaking. We don't want to have the knee border breaking. Also, if we have the knee border breaking, there might be two panels down here. And this border breaking might lead the eye from here to his face, down the body, through the leg, into this panel. And this is panel number three. That's not the time. Panel number two has to come next. So um, let's border break stuff that is in the foreground. Oh, we can even border break uh, the head a little bit. That looks super dynamic. I'm now also going a little bit outside the life area, but it's still going to be in print. It's still not going to be in the bleed. So that's really important. So don't don't exaggerate it too much. Uh, and now I'm going to go to my um, to my construction here, blah, 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 and oh, doesn't work because I'm not painting the white. Take a mask, a layer mask here. I'm just going to erase that. So if we need to have more border breaking, I can erase more of the layers. And it's going to be uh, very easy. Um, 
Now we have him flying, which is which is great. Let's add a cape. We don't see that much of the cape here, unfortunately. So we're not going to be um, going too close into this. Um, but the, the cape is coming out here, going maybe back there. It's going over his shoulder. It's going to come out here. Some people exaggerate the capes like crazy, uh, like Spawn, for example, Tom McFarlane uh, has, has done this a lot. So um, this is a possibility uh, to maybe uh, draw a cape and also not exaggerate it too much. Just gonna add a couple lines in here to make it gray so we see their shading. And um, now he's Superman. Now he's Superman, right? But he also lives in Metropolis and we've just seen the cover with the buildings in the background and the buildings were all very flat. So there's, there's multiple ways of of, of doing backgrounds, right? The easiest way indeed, and I have like two minutes left, I think, the easiest way indeed is to just do horizontal, right? And just do this, for example. And then because we're in Photoshop, right, I can just copy paste the heck out of this. It's no problem at all. Just duplicate layers, boom, 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 put it in there. This is this is kind of nice. Okay, now we have now we have a skyline here. This is layer 12. I'm gonna flatten this all together because we're just sketching. So I don't have to be uh, too aware of this. Now stuff gets difficult. Oh, what has happened here? That's called a tangent. We don't want that. We want to avoid that like the devil. So either things are uh, intersecting, uh, overlapping, or they're or they're not touching. If anything touches in in 2D, it also means it touches in 3D, and that's not possible here. So we want to we want to uh, do away with that stuff. So we have some buildings in here, and we can give them like hotel. Careful with writing, by the way. If you, for example, put hotel in here, like really big, this will pop out. This will distract from Superman. Why does it distract from Superman? Because it's writing. You have brought a new graphic element into this panel that is an arbitrary icon that is uh, agreed upon. We know what it is. So this is the shot where it flies over a hotel. This, this will burn into people's memory. So be careful about this, right? Um, um, you could just put an advertisement here and then you have something else, right? Just put an advertisement there and it's fine. If you put something that you cannot read here, then that's good. But be careful about stuff um, that, um, that, uh, that actually has a read. Now I'm looking at this, I'm like, you know what? This works, this is a good frame. But for me, this doesn't have enough oomph. This doesn't have enough speed to it. So what I'm gonna do, and it's so easy doing this, Photoshop, Control T, make it larger, make it smaller, and give it more power. Whoa, that adds so much so, so quickly. <laughs> Boom, now I'm gonna erase this part here. I'm gonna erase uh, this part here. I'm gonna continue drawing this. Maybe I actually don't want this. I wanna I want have this here. So now I'm, I'm gonna give it more, um, I can put a building in here like uh, in a different perspective, like like the side of a building, for example, and there's an advertisement here. For example, if I, if I put an advertisement sign here, I would not put like uh, like like a letter here, like maybe a letter, but now this is the image with K, so it attracts us, right? So rather put uh, a, an image in there, like a, a character that is not rendered well or a product shot, something like that. Or if you do Western comics and people don't know Japanese symbols, right? You can do Japanese symbols. Right? We don't know what they are. They don't have any meaning for us. They don't distract us from that. So this is a possibility. And then we put in the the this thing and then all all we need is a little bit of clouds maybe put in a couple of clouds here these clouds can be dynamic and actually go into the perspective so what i'm doing here is basically i'm drawing a corner right you have elements that come from this direction and have other elements that go in this direction and i'm doing this with everything i'm doing this with the building in the front what's coming in i'm doing this with the cloud here and i'm doing this with this cloud differently this cloud is not going in this direction this cloud is going here so I might want to have stuff that is actually pointing in his direction. So uh, that's a great way of, of doing this. If I now go up and want to pop it a little bit more, I'm going to duplicate the layer just to make it read better. Boom, gets darker, takes five seconds. Photoshop, yay, I don't need to trace all the lines. And then I want to make sure that I have really strong lines separating foreground from background. This gives me an idea about how to do it later on um, in, in the real line drawing too, that I want to have them really nicely pumping. So last point for today, I know we're over time, but I have to make this point. Never have backgrounds elements overlap. That's not good. 
for example, if I put a, a bird in here, very simple a bird, right? I can even make it make it strong and, uh, and make it fly here. These are birds. No problem, right? They're in the background. We know they're the bird. It's, it's, it's perfectly fine. What if I do a bird in here and have it overlap? Oopsie. Okay, I have to go to the layer mask, kill the layer mask. And now what's happening? This bird is coming to the front and it's, it's now like a tiny bird, but it's flying with Superman together. The same thing would happen if I, or even worse, if I took one of the buildings in the background and, and went in and made one of the buildings like super high and had it like overlap, make Empire State Building, something like that, and make it overlap and, uh, and have this. So see how it pops to the front, even though it should be further in the back? So that doesn't work. Careful with overlapping elements. Just keep it very simple, make it easy to read and add as much perspective as you can. This was a really quick frame. Tomorrow we'll come back. We'll do a uh, we'll do a little text, and you will uh, contribute you back home. You will contribute your hero, your favorite hero. Let us know what they are. Um, and uh, yeah, you're gonna bring your own hero, and I'm gonna draw it on a page in a script, a full page sketching out like this. I'll be very much pressed for time. It's gonna be insane, but it's also gonna be fun. Well, this was incredible. Dare I say super. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, that, that last panel was really, really good. And I think the I think the chat agrees. We both say so many great tips. This was amazing. What a great artist. So thank you so much, Klaus, for all this insight. Can't wait for tomorrow. And I'm sure everyone agrees that this was a very insightful and, inspi and inspiring presentation. Uh, thank you also to everybody who participated in the chat. Uh, hope to see you all again here tomorrow at the same time, same place on Adobe Live. Absolutely. Bye-bye, everybody.